welcome to Joy in Our Town. I'm Ann Farrell Tata, your host, and I am delighted to welcome today Angela Kellum. Angela is the Executive Director at Samaritan House, and our issue today is public safety, and our topic is domestic violence. Angela, thank you so much for being with us today, and welcome. Thank you. Thanks for including me. So when it comes to public safety, why should we be concerned about domestic violence? Well, you know, it's a real misnomer to most of us to think that violence is perpetrated by strangers, when in fact the majority of the violence is perpetrated by somebody we know. In fact, on average, every 24 minutes, someone in the United States is either raped, abused, or stalked. One in four women, one in seven men, it's 12 million people a year. It really is an issue of public safety. Well, what does it look like? What, what exactly, can you tell a little bit about what it looks like? Sure. I think one of the other issues that we face in trying to explain domestic violence is that it's a really complex sort of a thing. But when you boil it right down, it's about control and power. Somewhere on a continuum from maybe controlling the finances, controlling what someone wears, being aware of where they are all the time, up to physical violence, and 30% of the time, 30% of our homicides are related to domestic violence, and that's sort of the ultimate of what domestic violence might look like. Well, who is most likely affected? Well, domestic violence can affect everyone or anyone. It could be your neighbor, the person that sits in the pew with you at church, it could be a co-worker. In fact, domestic violence cuts across every single socioeconomic group, every ethnic group. Um, it's really a pervasive issue and that's part of the reason we want to get the word out today and give folks some information about how to address it and, and like you said, what does it look like. Well, in, in this area, obviously, we have a lot of military. Are you finding the numbers are higher in a military community? I think one of the issues that we face here in Hampton Roads is a special dynamic within the military because the, if the abuser is um, in the military, then their whole career, the family's livelihood, all of the health insurance may be attached to that. And so victims may be more reluctant to get the help that they need because it's such a struggle for them within the additional constraints and barriers of being a military dependent. So living in Hampton Roads, one of the things that all of us that are working to end domestic violence are focused on is helping our military advocates get the tools they need, being able to make sure that folks know where to turn for help, and then working through those really complex issues with families who are in crisis. So you do work with the advocates, the military advocates? Absolutely. In fact, there's a community critical response team and the military advocates play a major role there. In many cases, the civilian population um, or the civilian providers are maybe the safest place for someone to go in the early phases of trying mm -hmm. to deal with um, a battering situation. Now, sometimes, you know, friends and family, and you hear this all the time, they wonder why do people stay with an abuser? Can you talk about some of the reasons that that's what's going on with them? Well, I think the first thing to recognize is nobody goes to church or goes to a ball game, picks out someone that's abusive and says, hey, I'd really like to fall in love with this person. Right. So the first thing is to understand those sort of how does the relationship develop. So in most cases, batterers are extremely charming. Um, they're very uh, attentive, which can be a sort of a heady thing. Uh, you know, when someone tells you they can't live without you. But one of the early warning signs is when someone advances the relationship very quickly. They want to get very serious very quickly. And, and so there is a lot of love interrupted by really difficult, um, traumatic experiences. And so the victim remembers that part. Mm. How, how the periods of love can look. Um, but the other issue is th it's a very complex to leave. In fact, it's very dangerous to leave, which is why folks should have a safety plan. But the other issue is they may be very isolated, which is one of the things abusers do. They sort of separate you from your support group. You may be wor not working outside the home. You have no finances. It may even be controlled to the point that you don't even have the keys to the car. So just leaving is really a misnomer. It's a very complex process that really requires a lot of support. So how can family and friends respond to someone who they think is experiencing domestic violence? 
You know, I think the very first thing is to put our own egos aside. You know, mm. often we're embarrassed. What if we're wrong? What if our intuition is off? And what I tell people is, if you're feeling it in your heart or deep inside, something is amiss. Yeah. It could be something as simple as saying, I'm really thinking about you. You seem to be going through some difficult time. I'm really here for you. And then listen and not mm. be judgmental. The last thing you want to say is just leave because you could be putting them at risk, but it also sort of shuts down the process. So if you think something is going on, be available. Try to reach out and stay in contact because remember, isolation is one of the key strategies that abusers use to keep someone in the relationship. So even if they don't answer your phone calls, don't stop. Drop them a text. Find reasons to be near them. Let them know that you're there and that you're non-judgmental. And if, in fact, they leave and then go back to their batterer, as many times as it takes, don't turn your back, don't get frustrated, really be there for them. On average, it takes seven times for a victim to leave their abuser. I think that's such a good point because, you know, first of all, you can't really trust the person to say, no, there's no problem because they have probably learned how to hide it. Absolutely. And then you can, I can see how a friend would get impatient with, you know, why are you going back again? So that I, that's really wise to say, just hang in there with them and keep encouraging and always be there. For exactly. Them. And make reduce every barrier. So if they think they're going to have to explain their decision to you, they're less likely to come to you for help. But here's some other really practical things. Help them develop a safety plan. And if you don't mm -hmm. know how to do that, connect them with resources. Yeah. It might be something simple like be willing to hold a little bag that's got some personal belongings, maybe the extra set of car keys, maybe the cash that they're stashing away as they're planning for the inevitable leaving. Um, to help them worry. Often folks don't leave because of their pets. Mm. Sometimes they can't leave because they're worried about the safety of their children. Right. Those, are, those are worries that a friend or a family member can help the victim overcome. So they're really practical things as well as sort of emotional support things where family and friends can really help make the difference. And that's, so that's, those are some really good first steps for, the, for a friend to, if they want to intervene to start suggesting some of these safe, um, planning trips to plan for an escape. Exactly. In fact, it could be something as simple as, why don't we just go together and talk to somebody who's in the know? I don't have yeah. all the answers and you probably don't either, but I'll go with you. So where can victims turn for assistance if they, if they are seeing this and they want help and if maybe a friend hasn't intervened, where can they turn for assistance? Well, I think the first thing is, um, in a very anonymous way, they can call hotlines. There are hotlines in every city, and there's a national hotline for um, military folks. 4302120 in Virginia Beach will get you to Samaritan House's crisis line, and there are human beings on the end of that line, 24-7, mm. 365. And they'll help work through a safety plan. Victims know how to keep themselves alive, and so that safety plan really needs to be personalized based around their particular situation. Sometimes you can turn to your pastor. Sometimes you can turn to somebody at work, and they may have the information you need. But just know there are crisis lines staffed across this country, and a simple phone call may be all you need to feel safe, to feel a bit safer as you're creating your plan. When I love that you talk about the uh, affirming them, you know, they are survivors and so, and they've probably been beaten down, but I love that you are addressing the fact that really they're survivors, that they've learned how to cope. Some of the strongest this, yeah. folks that you will ever meet. And I think that's important for friends and family. They may see them as being weak and they've been told over and over by their batterer right. that they're not worthy, that they're weak. But in reality, the fact that they've kept themselves and often their children alive means they're very very um, savvy, um, they're very focused and committed to the mm. safety of their children, and so you want to build on that strength, and you want to recognize that. Right. Um, our approach is a strength-based approach. Oh, this is what you already great. know, this is the value you already bring to it, and we're just going to give you some additional help. Yeah, that's wonderful. So speaking of the children, though, how are children affected by the domestic violence? Well, you know, sadly, the data shows, and everything that our um, work does now is based on research, 
Seventy percent of the little boys that grow up in a household with an abusive relationship will be batterers themselves. Mm -hmm. 60% of the little girls will gravitate to, towards those same kinds of relationships as adults because that's all they know in terms of right. the relationships um, between intimate partners. And so prevention is a huge issue. So part of the repair work, if you will, that is done by domestic violence providers is really helping children with the psychosocial, emotional, academic delays and impact that's caused by violence in the household. It's imperative if we're mm. going to end violence yeah. that we get to the children and help them develop healthy relationships and a real understanding about that dynamic. When I've heard that they are even seeing signs as early as middle school. Oh my goodness. Domestic violence, you know, technology is helpful, but it can be used as a tool by abusers. We are now seeing as early as sixth grade with cell phones that young people are getting into relationships a lot earlier and they're using the cell phones as a way of stalking. Oh, mm -hmm. I need to know where you are all the time. I miss you so much. And that unhealthy control relationship is starting that early. So offer us hope. I mean, can you think of, a, of an example of somebody who was in an abusive situation and was able to break out of it and, and is living a healthy life now? Well, and that's the good news. I mean, with the right supports, um, there is hope for everyone, and, and that's what folks need to know because they do feel very hopeless and helpless um, in many cases. But we recently um, connected with a woman who literally had been married 25 years. The first 10 years of her marriage, she didn't notice any mm. issues, but they were very subtle. And it, it escalated to the point that she was completely isolated, had no money, and made the call to the hotline. Um, came in to shelter. We were able to work with some great friends that had been missing her. They were able to help her get a job. She was able oh. to move out, get an apartment on her own, and she's healthy and happy today. But think about living 20 or 25 years in an abusive situation and still being able to make the disconnection and, and be free of that. And we're really excited for her. And she is yeah. now a volunteer with us because wow. there's nothing more powerful than one survivor yeah. turning to someone who's just starting their journey. Absolutely. But that's really remarkable that she for 10 years, she didn't, you said the signs were subtle, but she really didn't realize exactly. for 10 years. And maybe there, maybe, was there something that triggered 10 years in? Well, I think it was the age of the children. At oh, that point, the yeah. children became more independent. She was taking them out of the house. The batterer was losing control because she was out and about, and so things escalated. And I think that was probably, for the batterer, the trigger was when she now had a reason to be leaving that house on a regular right. basis, and he could not control her. And so it escalated mm. to violence and broken bones and black eyes, and ultimately, she finally feared for her life and that of her children, and that's what caused her to flee. Wow, that's really, that's, I know that's going to touch a lot of people because they, th that's going to mean something. So we're about to go to a break, but are there some practical things that we can do as a community to work toward ending domestic violence? Well, I think the first thing is to try to remove the shame of people being able to come forward. Remember, this takes place in across the board. And so we can't assume that just because, fill in the blank, somebody works a certain place or lives a certain place that it's so public awareness is one. We really need volunteers to help us man all mm. of us as providers to be there to respond um, in the middle of the night for the phone call and recognizing that it really is a public safety issue and it's no longer just a family issue to be dealt with behind closed doors. Right. And as you said, it crosses all barriers, all socioeconomic and income and everything. Absolutely. No, it's no respecter of persons. That's right. So uh, again, we're with Angela Kellum, and we're so glad you're uh, with us today, and we hope you'll stay with us through the break. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. Okay, so maybe. May 
I walk you across the street? Uh, sure. Why not? Thanks. You're welcome. Welcome to Joy in Our Town. I'm Ann Farrell Tata, your host, and I'm pleased to welcome Angela Kellum, our, the executive director at the Samaritan House. And our issue today is women's safety, and our topic is domestic violence. Um, Angela, can you talk about how can women practice safety? Well, I think the first thing is to remember what I said earlier, which is most of your risk, um, personal safety risk, is going to come from someone you know. So I still advocate always go places in pairs, have your cell phone out and ready if you're in an unfamiliar environment, let folks know where you're going. Um, if you're at a party and you're unaccompanied, don't drink anything that you didn't pour yourself. And so those are the common things that you think about in terms of stranger violence. But the real issue is more than likely if you're going to experience violence, rape, stalking, domestic violence, it's literally going to come from somebody you know. It might be your own boyfriend, um, but in many cases it could even be a friend of a friend. It could be the father of a friend. It mm -hmm. could be a business associate. But in the majority of the cases, women are injured by somebody they already know. Does the research talk about do friends tell another friend? Or is, it, or is it more that friends just notice something's amiss? Generally, it's the intuition of someone outside the relationship mm -hmm. that realizes something's going on. The dilemma is, again, it's embarrassing. Right. There might be shame associated. Um, the person that's experiencing the violence may really believe they brought it on themselves. Often the yes. batterer will say, you know, I didn't want to hit you, but you're the one who didn't do whatever. You know what I, you know how tense I am when I come home from, from work. So generally it is a friend or a family member that has a sense that something's not right. It may be that Susie always came to all the family functions and now suddenly she's not coming to Easter. There's always an excuse. She leaves early. She is she will say things like, I'm living on eggshells. She'll look like she's walking on eggshells because she's trying to keep from triggering the abuse. Right. Um, so yeah, friends and family often are the ones who need to take that first step towards the individual. And again, just let them know, I'm worried about you, I'm here to help. Well, can you talk a little bit about the nurture versus nature? Because you had mentioned earlier about 70% of boys and 60% of girls, and what? how does that impact the... It's just, and, and I think it goes back to the societal pressures and some of the issues that we need to deal with at the community level. That's why I, I say that domestic violence really is a public safety issue. Um, if all you have known, if you have grown up with screaming and yelling and belittling and control, that's all you know about a relationship. And so batterers, in many cases, have grown up as children Un living with a batterer. And that's why batterer intervention programs are a really essential component of how our community needs to respond to domestic violence. So you and I have spent a lot of time talking about the victim, but if we don't embrace effective mechanisms for helping batterers understand the dynamic that causes them to batter, then we won't prevent domestic violence. We'll just be intervening over and over again. I think it's really telling that Grace Orsini, who's the board chair for Samaritan House and has been working with women in domestic violence for 20 years, now leads a number of batterer intervention programs because she understands that if we don't address the batterer as much as we address the victim, we're really not going to end this cycle of violence. And what are some of the things that she's doing with in helping? Well, I think one of the issues is, one of the key things you see in a batterer is they don't take responsibility for anything. It's not just in domestic violence. So when you see someone who says, well, I only, it wasn't my fault. I did so and so because my boss caused this problem mm -hmm. or my parents were the problem. Right there is a dynamic that justifies their behavior. And so coming to terms with that, learning to take responsibility and accept the and accept your own accountability and things but also looking at the pain and the dynamics of your own family and how that may have brought you to the point of using control with someone else is a huge component and it's not work that's done quickly 
it's long-term work and and it's psychological work and it's practical um, interventions with batterers. Is that, you mentioned that, is that something that uh, a woman should be on the lookout if, if she's dating a man or married to a man that is always blaming someone else? Is that uh, It's right a up there. Flag? Right. Yeah. There are some of those early warning signs. You know, as, I, as, as we've talked, no one goes into a relationship and says, this person is going to beat me up one day. Right. They go in with the same hope that all of us do with a new relationship. And generally batterers are very charming and they're very attentive. But if you start as you get to learn about someone's background and they say, well, I, my behavior's excused because somebody else caused mm. this, that's one of those early warning signs. It's right. right up there with pushing the relationship too quickly, getting serious too quickly, and saying things like, you're my whole world, without you I can't go on. It is that whole sort of insidious manipulation that pulls somebody into an abusive relationship. Oh, and can you talk about some of the things that are happening right here in Hampton Roads? That I will, and, and here I'm really gonna sort of take a step back and talk about the system, if you will. So we've talked about individuals and we've talked about families, but in order for our community to create a safe system, a system of safety for domestic violence victims, we've really got to be working with the Commonwealth's Attorney's Office, with the police to give them the tools they need when they intervene, when, they, when they're called to a situation. We've got to make sure that um, victims have um, advocates right there when they need them, not 30 minutes later and not tomorrow. So one of the things that we're really excited about is the City of Virginia Beach is moving ahead with something called Fatality Review where we will actually sit down and do continual quality review of all of the systems that come into play. So we'll take old cases, the Commonwealth's Attorney's Office will pick cases from five or six years ago, and we'll sit down with the military, with domestic violence providers, with prosecutors, with defense attorneys, with the medical examiner, and we'll look at homicides that came from domestic violence and we'll try to figure out how does the system have to be different to save somebody's life and then we'll make improvements and then we'll take another case and it's bringing sort of what we've learned from the business world about continual quality improvement to the safety system in Hampton Roads so that all of us can respond differently in our own unique way to reduce the number of folks that actually lose their lives to domestic violence and that takes you know, that takes everybody being involved. It takes a total review of the entire system. But we're really excited that we're moving forward in, in Hampton Roads in that regard. Now, will you be sharing that with the community once you? We absolutely will, yeah. um, in lots of different ways. So you'll there'll be a proclamation and a oh, resolution yeah. from city council. But more importantly, as we learn where the deficits are in our systems and how we can improve things, then there'll be a whole educational component in the newspapers, in the schools, in the churches. We're really excited that both the um, Commonwealth Attorney's Office and um, Chief Severa in Virginia Beach, the police chief, have both made a commitment to walk hand in hand with us to look at how our system of safety can be improved. Well, and I'm sure when whenever there is an unfortunate, tragic event, people do start coming out of the woodwork to to address this. So it's good that you're doing you're sort of running interference and in getting this out ahead of time instead of waiting for a, a tragedy to occur. Well, when you think about 30 percent of our homicides are related to domestic violence, mm. that's a huge issue. It's an, it's an issue for the police department in terms of, the, of their workload. Um, domestic violence, e even when it doesn't result in a mortality and a death, has a huge impact on our economy. Lost right. days at work, um, um, distractions, children missing school because of the chaos associated, then they fall mm -hmm. behind. So there really is a ripple effect through our entire economy and our community when there's violence behind closed doors. Right. And so we've got to do something about that. And, and clearly when you have a fatality, we need to be looking at our system and how we can improve to keep people's um, lives from being in jeopardy. How do those figures compare to the national 
Well, we're right, you know, you hate to say it, but yeah. we're right in the running with the national numbers. Oh, it is not disproportionately high. Our worry is that because of the transient nature of right. our community and because of the military component here, we may not be responding in the specific and unique ways that military families need us to respond. So that's why the military community, their advocates, um, their, their family service providers are going to be doing this work um, with us because they play such an important role in our community. So um, it, where can women, I mean going back to the women and, and mm -hmm. really protecting them, first of all how can they be more observant of their surroundings to just on a real practical level? Can you talk about some practical things that well, women... Well sure and, and again this is where technology can help you. So be alert um, when you get into a car, for instance, make sure you check the back seat, especially if it's tinted windows. Check your car before you get in. If you're shopping alone, you're traveling alone, park under a light. Um, be aware of who, when you pull in, if you're getting out of your car, who is mingling around in that parking lot, um, who's, who is watching you in a store maybe and following you out. Whenever you can go in groups, obviously go in groups. Make sure somebody knows where you're going. If, for instance, you're traveling home from work, if you're gonna deviate from your normal path because of traffic or something, let somebody know that. Um, again, keep your cell phone available. Make sure you have, um, in case of emergency, ICE, have your emergency numbers there. Um, but really being attentive to who is in your space. You know, we're, we'll be distracted doing what woman is not doing 30 or 40 things? And that's really what puts us at risk. Right. Puts us at risk for lots of different reasons. And so I think planning for the for something that you hope will never happen is yeah. the is the most important safety tip that I can give a woman today. Are there any predictors? I mean, you hear about women that you know they they'll say my my boyfriend or my husband would, would never do that, even though they show some signs. But are there any predictors that somebody that's going to cross the line and do something? Well, yeah, I, I think there really are. Um, if you see the following kinds of things either personally in your own relationship or you observe them in the relationship of a friend, um, belittling um, comments in public. Mm -hmm. That might look like off humor, um, sort of tearing someone down, uh, roughhousing, uh, threatening to do something but saying it's in jest. You know, oh, I'll knock you out. I'll yeah. knock your front teeth out. Um, anything that sort of calls down the other person's self-esteem. If you're gonna do it in public, that's a very good indicator that it's 10 times worse at home. So mm. I think those kinds of things, and if anyone ever puts their hands near your throat, the most, the highest um, relationship between death is any threat of strangulation. It oh is most gosh. highly correlated with um, uh, the highest level of violence. Well, Angela, you have been giving us some wonderful information, and uh, we appreciate so much you coming out mm -hmm. today, and thank you, and uh, we just wish you the best with, with your programs that you're rolling out. This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network and made possible by your telethon dollars. Your continual support can keep Joy in Our Town brought to your home every day. So write Joy in Our Town, P.O. Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711.